good evening and uh, namaskar to uh, all so first of all i welcome all of you to this uh, memorial uh, lecture uh, that we are organizing for uh, uh, professor adwaita mahanti so professor adwaita mahanti was uh, born on 14th march uh, 1945 and uh, he breathed his last on october 13 2018 and i should also tell you like the context uh, in fact he was uh, uh, nominated as the editor in chief of uh, odisha economic journal then it was to odisha economic journal uh, in the uh, golden jubilee conference at uh, nabagrishna chaudhary center for development studies and he was uh, editing the journal and uh, uh he but he was working on the last paper okay, of the journal and uh, because uh, we know uh, you know that uh, we published the journal uh, or we released the journal in the annual conference uh, every year and uh, but uh, adit sir no died on uh, october 13th and uh, so he could not in fact see the first issue of the journal that he was editing and uh, adit sir was a teacher of uh, mine I, i was a student and i think many of our life members of koye would be a direct student of uh, professor adit mahanti and professor adit mahanti taught uh, uh, in my batch actually he was teaching uh, in the first year he taught us welfare economics and uh, then in the second year he taught uh, a part of environmental economics newly introduced in fact that was the first year when the environmental economics was introduced in uh, uttal university that is in 2004 and uh, sir was teaching a part of environmental economics and uh, then uh, uh, international trade and he was like he was a very good teacher and he would very he would give very good references and uh, uh, in fact unlike many other people uh, he would give the exact reference that he would use actually for his teaching and so we'd be happy to uh, like see uh, that uh, uh, and uh, then he would also used to give us advice advice that uh, when you become teachers uh, uh, never keep the note that you prepare for your teaching uh, you prepare a note you take the class but you give this note to some students so that next year you prepare Yes. Okay. Otherwise, you know, if you keep, if you preserve the notes, you will fall back on those notes, and you will not read anything new. So don't keep the notes with you. So uh, that kind of advice he used to give us when he was a teacher. Okay. So uh, sir uh, was the president of uh, OEA, and also he was a member of executive committee for a long time, and then he was editor in chief of the uh, Odisha Economic Journal. so uh, with this brief introduction about uh, professor uh, uh, adit mahanti uh, now i uh, uh, let me introduce that okay professor sodamini das uh, will be giving this uh, uh, memorial lecture today and this session will be chaired by you know, the president of prasa economics association professor kesab das and the title of the lecture is uh, Uh, well the implications of heat stress on urban informal sector uh, so with this uh, brief note let me invite uh, uh, professor kesab das the president of research universities to preside over this meeting and also i thank you know uh, from the, in the at the outset professor sadamin das for accepting our request uh, uh, at a very short notice to deliver this lecture So this uh, uh, it's over to you, sir. Yes, sir, sir. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Amarendra. And uh, as I have often said that uh, I mean, by presiding really it doesn't mean anything because we have a great speaker with us, and uh, we also know that uh, she is one of those very very rare uh, economists. I must say, uh, from Odisha comes from. from a rural area uh, from uh, a village called muruda uh, of gop in puri district and uh, he studied at kakatpur the school level but then uh, and also at the scs college of puri but then he moved on to 
study at uh, very well known uh, universities like the JNU and the University of Delhi. And before I uh, say uh, a little more about her work, uh, let me make a very special uh, reference to one of our most uh, path breaking uh, studies, um, which actually relates to uh, what is uh, sort of uh, known as the uh, the, the uh, known as the mystery of mangroves. Uh, in fact, she has done uh, extremely interesting work and sort of focusing on the storm protection services of the mangroves. Uh, sort of our study was based in Odisha, and this particular study has uh, attracted global attention. Uh, this is sort of rated as one of the best ever uh, sort of studies in environmental and ecological uh, economics, uh, and a, a short movie has been. Uh, sort of made by the American uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, and there is a special uh, article on this subject in the Nature Conservancy uh, magazine. Uh, and uh, also it is uh, sort of like uh, circulated by the Forestry Division of the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, as one of the, uh, one of the leading uh, articles and some, uh, some piece of research uh, which others will be uh, inspired to work on. So with that very special uh, sort of like kind of research she has done. I also know uh, Professor Sodam Indas to, to, to an extent, and I always feel very proud about her uh, because very unlike many uh, so-called professors, I think she really uh, goes to the field and in very, very extreme conditions, she lives there, sort of interacts with people and, uh, and sort of like her observations are so well grounded, grounded uh, all caps, um, that makes uh, her work uh, really uh, path breaking and she, uh, so no wonder uh, sort of she, uh, she has been uh, actually a TTI fellow uh, and a NABA chair professor at the IEG for about uh, 10 years. Uh, she is a fellow, very highly regarded fellow, I must say, of the South Asian Network for Development and Environmental Economics, Sandy, as you know it. Uh, she is a senior fellow of the Environment for Development uh, Initiative of the University of Gothenburg uh, and a Mahler a scholar at the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics, Swedish, uh, Royal Swedish Academy uh, of Sciences uh, in Stockholm. Uh, her work, uh, in fact, sort of uh, uh, relates to mostly uh, evaluation of adaptation to climate change, evaluation of ecosystem services, vulnerability analysis, and economics of natural disasters. Uh, she has obviously published in very, very top ranking global uh, journals, uh, uh, whether it is proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the US, the world development, climate change, climate change economics, natural hazard, estuarine, coastal and self sciences, urban studies, and of course, economic and uh, political weekly. And uh, she also is one of the editors of, of, of the two very, very uh, distinguished uh, journals in the profession, uh, Ecological Economics and Cambridge Prism uh, Coastal Future. So uh, even if I have sort of given a very, very brief introduction to her, uh, uh, I also uh, uh, I also must add that uh, at this uh, moment she is with, she is a professor with Swami Sradhanan College of the University of Delhi and uh, she is a senior visiting fellow at the Institute of Economic Growth uh, also in Delhi. Uh, so we are very happy, uh, very privileged to have Professor uh, Soda Minidas, uh, who uh, has been an inspiration for many, many young scholars. And very often, even if personally, I have done very little work in this area, uh, very often people have uh, mentioned uh, her name to me uh, at times sort of uh, getting uh, a, sort of like maybe encouraged by the fact that we share the same surname. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, let me uh, sort of uh, request uh, Professor Sodhami Das. Uh, but I, let me also, as I'm chairing the session, maybe also tell one or two, a few uh, lines about uh, this whole topic uh, on the thermal uh, stress or the heat stress on which should be speaking. Uh, in fact, uh, as she would tell us more, uh, this is one of the uh, sort of areas in which not much work has been done. I mean, in India, maybe the Center for Science and Environment uh, sort of they have come up with a sort of a detailed uh, like a regional level, the state level study and uh, sort of focusing on some of the cities uh, and sort of like, and one interesting finding they have, I'm sure Professor Das knows it, uh, that uh, so typically we thought that the Northwestern uh, region 
let's say Rajasthan, Gujarat, uh, these kind of areas are probably sort of more affected by, let's say, temperature rise uh, going beyond, let's say, 45 at times. But then this sort of analysis by the CAC uh, suggests that now this is sort of the, this has spread to several other regions. Uh, so that makes it really uh, important for us to hear Professor Sodhamanindas. Uh, we also know that there are a lot of studies done in the African context. Uh, whether it is in Egypt, in, in Kenya, in Namibia, several such, uh, because that's where I think a lot of uh, recognition of this issue has been uh, sort of made. Uh, and we are really uh, happy and we are looking forward to listening to Professor Sudhavani Das. Please. Thank you very much for this kind and, you know, since this is such an overwhelming statement coming from you. Thank you very much for this introduction. So first of all, <coughs> Prof. Das and Dr. Amarendra and other office bearers of Orissa Economic Association, thank you to give this honor to me by asking me to deliver this particular fifth Atyut Mahanti Memorial Lecture to you. I think this is one you know, invitation that has really made me overwhelmed with joy. And also I'm very humble because I'm a very, very small and very limited knowledge person you know, to do justice to this particular occasion, as Amarindra said, and also as I've heard from most of the students about the Tushar, I never had the you know person to be taught by him. But as I've heard from others, Sir was an institution himself because any topic you take on economics, you know, Sir had an answer to that, and Sir can give you some very sweet any queries you have, Sir can really very you know convincingly uh, fulfill all your queries. That's the type of person he was. He was an engine of knowledge. Anything on, you know, under economics, you can discuss with him. And as uh, Amarendra was telling, Sar was associated with Orissa Economic Association in so many different ways. And we all have been benefited because of his and his name and the way people talk about him. So though you have given me this big responsibility to deliver a lecture in memory of Sar, I hope I do justice and I'll try my best uh, to do that. And if there are any mistakes, anything I do, so please do forgive me because I still consider myself a very, very limited and a very you know, uh, limited knowledge person in this area. On development economics, I have very limited knowledge. Whatever work I do is either on the environmental issues or on the climate change issues, though I try to link up to a development to some extent, but still um, really not much of a person on the welfare issues that has been very you know, a core to Aditya Sar's uh, teaching and also his uh, economic philosophy. But I, in my lecture, I'll try to link up uh, my studies to some of the welfare indicators. Right? So with the due respect to Aditya Sar, let me start my lecture and start sharing my screen. Sorry, just one second. So, uh, Amarendra, is it okay? Is it visible now? Uh, yes, it is coming. It is coming. Okay. Okay. So, this is the uh, topic of my lecture. Welfare implications. Sorry. Anybody wanting to say something? No. No. Can uh, we request people to uh, remain, uh, keep their mic mute? I, I will manage that. I will manage that. Okay. Thank you. So this is the topic of my lecture, welfare implications of a huge stress on the urban informal sector. In course of my topic, I'll just try to give some idea what exactly I'm going to talk about uh, in this uh, talk. So these are the points I'm going to uh, you know, touch upon. I'll combine insights from two of my studies, one in the cities of Obernesur and Sambalpur that I did myself in the year 2013-14, and a very recent study that I did with the Professor E. Somanathan of ISI Delhi in Delhi. So the ideas and insights from both the studies I'm going to combine and present before you. 
so the orissa study provides basically the theoretical background and details about adaptive behavior how people are coping up with this particular stress the poor people and whereas in delhi study we have you know generated some empirical result that i'm going to share with you these results that i think i should emphasize are very undiluted in the sense you know we, we try to have designed the study in such a way that our result is you know brings out some of the very pure impact of heat stress on the income of the people on some of their welfare indicators so this is what is the beauty of the study that i am going to uh, show you and probably this delhi study is one of the you know the first study to provide such an estimate for the first time globally though there has been many studies on the slum dwellers on the informal sector the maximum of those studies are on the health impacts how people are coping up what exactly is going to happen to the health status of people if because of the climate change but nobody has estimated the income loss of the slum dwellers or the informal sector workers because of the heat stress so that is what is the highlight of our study that we did in delhi and i'm going to share these results with you now just to give you this background so why do we say that is an income loss because of the temperature health link temperature health link has been studied by many people in many different areas so we say that are basically two different lines of uh, you know uh, correlation one is one economic loss is being caused by productivity loss and the other one is because of the absenteeism so whenever there is a high temperature and that has a negative impact on the health so that causes a productivity loss and that is one robust finding that is coming out both from the agronomic studies where people do you know investigation in the laboratories and also in economic studies where people have panel data or long time series data and they do some econometric estimation and they try to find out how labor supply effective labor supply is getting affected because of increase in temperature so you have evidences and good publications in both these areas that says with every 1 degree increase in temperature there is a productivity loss because labor productivity is going down people are not able to work with a full efficiency so this is one uh, you know uh, causal link that leads to uh, income loss or productivity loss because of a high temperature and the other one is absenteeism that means because of a high temperature many people they stop coming to the workplace so this is one study uh, i think this somanathan study that was published in 2021 and that was in a very good journal journal of public economics so there he proved that uh, some 2% that is increase in to uh, absenteeism by 2% for every 1 degree increase in temperature and also that is another ongoing study by somanathan and one of his student on this particular issue so these are the you know causes or these are the links through which because of high temperature there is productivity loss and that is also causing the output loss but these studies are all on the formal sector where you have a data available and from the secondary data people are able to study this but there is nothing on the informal sector so that is one you know uh, incentive there is one reason why i wanted to study informal sector so here uh, uh, let me not go much detail into this literature there's n number of studies that says how every 1 degree increase in temperature how much of a loss this is going to cause so only the global warming is going to reduce uh, global average global income by 23% you know there are so many studies and that is this particular study by hill and park that was published in 2013 that says uh, climate change is very regressive so the tropical the poor economies like india thailand and nigeria they are going to lose income by 3 to 4% for every 1 degree increase in temperature whereas the richer economies with the, which which are in the polar region like norway and sweden so they are going to have significantly high income because of the increase in temperature so this is very obvious that means the tropical countries are going to suffer more because they are more dependent on agriculture which is an exposed activity so because of this high exposure temperature increase is going to be very regressive and poor countries are going to be more poorer and richer countries are going to be more richer so there is this you know very recent study in uh, 2022 that says that uh, 
climate change or increase in temperature is going to increase poverty vulnerability. That means making poor more poorer with a high probability of people returning to poverty. That means if in one economy, tropical economy, 20% of the population are below poverty line, with increase in temperature, maybe this 20% is going to go up. Maybe 22 or 23% people will be below poverty line because poor are going to get more poorer. And those in who are in the margin, they're also going to be going below poverty line. So somehow this is how our you know, number of studies have just highlighted a few of them that says uh, high uh, temperature is bad for the economy. This is bad for the tropical economies especially, and that is going to make poor people more poorer and also are going to cause loss in income and loss in uh, labor supply and loss in many other things. It, and also there is a health impact uh, that says that both people are going to suffer from some you know, health ailments like nausea, fatigue, body ache, temperature, there are many things. In Odisha, our public health department has already identified number of health impacts which are attributable to high temperature, right? So, so what I you know to, just to summarize, heat stress can cause low income uh, due to lower productivity, heat hard the poorer and cause health ailments like nausea, fatigue, etc. So these are the you know impact of a temperature, the economic losses of a temperature rise. Now, then comes the question, why should we study informal sector? Because there has been no systematic study on climate change impact on the informal sector. As I said before, whatever information we have on the income loss or the negative impact on productivity, that is all for the formal sector. So at least 85 to 90 percent of the workforce in developing countries are working in the informal sector. So when you have no information on these guys, what they're doing, how much they're suffering. So that means the entire cost of climate change estimation is all underestimated because you are ignoring a significant person of the workforce who are you know, working in the exposed environment and they're living in the slums. They have very low adaptive capacity and because there is no data on them, so we are not able to say how they are doing, how much they are suffering, what is the impact and what exactly should be done so that... <laughs> okay, so that's good entertainment. So uh, there is a limited climate change research in the slums, as uh, Professor Das mentioned before. There has been some studies in Africa and also some on the Southeast Asia, but most of these are also in Bangladesh, but most of these are on the health sector. So there is very little on the I know how income loss or other type of economic loss these guys are suffering. And there is no estimates on suppose they are having a health impact so how much is the economic burden because of the health impact? So the economic estimates are missing. So this is where we try to you know, fill the gap. So like we have so many projects going on globally on the social cost of carbon estimates so that you know we have a carbon price which is representative of the cost of climate change. And unless we have information on the informal sector, so this social cost of carbon that is going to be highly underestimated. So this is important that we should study uh, informal sector, okay, and also come out with some robust finding that how exactly is the impact or economic loss of this particular sector because of climate change. Okay, so now, so this is my first study that uh, I did in Bhubaneswar and Sambalpur cities in the year 2013, and that was published in Climate Change Economics in the year 2015. This study was very limited. Because, you know, like uh, we just tried, this was an exploratory study with a very small budget. I think uh, maybe around two lakhs was the budget where we did the survey and we did all the analysis and everything. And we had the agency in Bhubaneswar who collected the data. But this was one paper, you know, that was, I think I had the quickest publication. Very soon, you know, I submitted the uh, to the journal and after two months, this paper got accepted because, you know, the findings are very interesting in spite of all the uh, caveats, all the limitations, which I'm going to tell you. So from this paper, I explain my theoretical background, why heat stress is going to have some impact on a poor family and how the poor family is going to adjust its labor supply whenever there is an extreme weather like a heat wave day. So to do that, 
So I take this clue uh, from this particular publishers, Wolf and Mackinnon, 2012, which is an IJD working paper, and Palmquist and etc., which is a publication in environmental resource economics. So what they did, they try to you know define a uh, neutrality maximization over time blocks. So I try to took this particular clue and uh, define my theoretical model to define how the time allocation is being affected by a poor household because of heat stress. So I think the household is having three activities, rest, housework, and work for earning. And I take work for earning as the residual because this is something the household is never going to touch because from here they're getting their income. So if there is because of the climate or because of the weather, if he's needing more time for rest or something or because of the housework, if you know he is needing he or she is needing more time for the housework, then they will be doing substitution between rest and housework, not the substitution between rest and earning or housework and earning. So this is the basic assumption I take. Z1 and Z2 are substitutable, and Z3 is something which is like a residual. The household will not touch Z3 unless there is a very, very strong requirement. Okay. So now the household is so duration of rest depend on atmospheric temperature. Housework follows constant returns to scale in labor time. That means if there is more requirement, then he or she would be spending more time. If there is less requirement, then they will be spending less time. Right. So now this is the utility maximization model. They are maximizing utility over Z1 and Z2, rest and housework. And then this is the labor requirement for rest. How much time they're allocating for? A labor allocation to rest. So you can see here, so this has a component of T. So T is the daytime temperature, the maximum temperature in a normal, uh, you know, uh, on a normal, uh, so the actual daytime maximum temperature in any day. And T star is the maximum variable temperature. So if there is a deviation, if T is a higher than T star, then, then we have a heat wave. Depending on the differences, we can have the severity of the heat wave. So now this is entering into the labor allocation. And C is the adaptation parameter. So this is a positive number which can take a value less than 1, not necessarily 0. But this can take a value less than 1. But this is higher for those people who do not have adaptation and this is lower for those people who have adaptation so this is how i call the adaptation parameter and this is the time allocation to rest and then this is the time allocation to housework and after l1 and l2 l3 is the time allocation to outside world so this is the time constraint okay and then this is the input constraint so which again i take a linear function because for both these activities rest and housework the input input requirement are very limited so i take a uh, simple linear function as my input requirement and then i come out with the budget constraint where this is the income which can be defined uh, you know when i put the value of uh, uh, l1 and l2 from here then this can be the uh, income from the uh, work. I, this here the wage W is not exactly the wage rate. Rather, this is the income per hour. Because uh, these are the guys who are working in the informal sector. So most of them are self-employed. So they are not working for somebody. So that is why we say that they are working in the exposed environment and they are having maximum impact from their environment. So W is the wage per hour. How much hours they spend on the outside work, that is how they get the income. And maybe this is the income from other sources. And this is their expenditure. Expenditure on rest, expenditure on housework, and plus other type of expenditure. So this is the budget constraint. And then you take the Lagrangian. And from the utility maximization, you come up with this ratio. So this determines the ratio of the shadow price lambda. So this is the utility from rest. This is utility from housework. So as you can see here, the utility from rest is depending on this, the shadow price. This is the uh, shadow price of the rest. And plus, this is the price from the uh, input requirement. And here, you have this temperature differences entering into the shadow price. Now, I take three different situations. Suppose in the, we have a very normal situation where T is equal to T star. That means the actual temperature is something which is variable. So in that case, T minus T star will be zero. 
and your labor requirement will be equal to this one. So this to her, you know, this term will be one. So this, <clears throat> and this is going to be L1 will be equal to this. And the marginal utility of rest upon marginal utility of housework, let's say, is equal to lambda, some number. And if it is a heat wave day, actual temperature is higher than this, then this is the labor allocation to rest. And this obviously is because T is greater than T star. This is a positive number. So if this is L1 is the labor allocation to time allocation to rest in a normal summer day, then in a heat wave day, the time allocation to rest is going to be higher because this is being multiplied by a positive number. So sometimes of the labor allocation in a normal day. So now this particular ratio, it will be lambda 1 and obviously lambda 1 will be higher than lambda which says that because of the high temperature, the shadow price of rest is going to increase or the marginal utility from rest is going to be higher than the marginal utility from the housework. So as a result, he or she is going to spend more time on rest. And if it is a comfortable day, very nice day, pleasant day, where the temperature is less than the bearable temperature, so then the labor allocation will be much lower because t minus t star will be negative so this is going to come to the denominator so as a result the uh, the shadow price will be lambda 2 which is less than the lambda and maybe there will be less time uh, devoted to rest and more time devoted to housework or maybe you will try to if there is extra time so he's going to spend that on the work work time now if there is more uh, demand for you know rest time if the household, if the, uh, the, in the main income earner of the household is wanting to spend more time on the rest, so most likely he's going to get it from the housework. So where does the labor allocation to work coming into picture? To show that, I use this particular production possibility curve. So in the x-axis, we have ledger. In the, J, in the y axis, we have the housework, and suppose AB is the production possibility curve. And I take two equilibrium E1 is a normal summer equilibrium, and E2 is a heat wave equilibrium. Now, if uh, when it is a normal summer day, suppose he is allocating this much of time 0 to Z1 star to rest and 0 to Z2 star to housework. Obviously, everything is going fine. So they is spending more time on the housework, this time to rest and going on well. And when it is a heat wave day, suppose his rest requirement increases to Z1 double star to this point. And he has only this much of time for the housework. He can allocate only Z2 star to housework. Now, housework has a, you know, it is constrained from below. That is a minimum number of hours you have to spend to the family for yourself to sleep, to take bath, or to do some minimum amount of work at home, which you cannot escape. So if that minimum constraint is here, you have to spend at least zero to Z2 star amount of time to the housework. But now you can spare only this much. So where is this extra time going to come from? Because you need minimum this much of time to rest. And so this is the time, this is corresponding to E star. Suppose E star is the equilibrium corresponding to minimum requirement for housework. So in this case, if your equilibrium is below E star, then your time allocation to housework is going to be below the minimum requirement. And in that case, this difference is going to come from your outside work. So your work time is going to suffer. But if you have a family, there is a lot of family support and you know uh, maybe so the person also has a lot of you know equipment at home so that even if he's sleeping for one or two hours he's getting a sound sleep or there are other things that is taking care of his health so maybe this constant will be below if this constant is below maybe at easter e2 he may not sacrifice his work time but if this constraint is not, if his adaptation is not there, if he's not having lot many people in the family to support him and his housework minimum time requirement is at this point, then obviously his work time is going to suffer. So this is how I you know, put my argument that there is a housework which is working as a cushion. 
in between the rest and like earlier we used to say labor leisure substitution but i said no not labor leisure substitution it is labor and housework substitution and if the substitution possibilities are not enough then maybe there will be labor and leisure substitution and this labor substitution will come only if your j2 star which is the minimum time needed for housework is above the equilibrium or time allocation to housework that means if your e2 is below this so if your e star is below this one then maybe even in spite of a he to it he or c is able to work and the uh, labor leisure substitution is not going to happen that the labor and the, le uh, the leisure and the housework substitution is going to be enough to take care of the work requirement so this is this was my basic argument when i did the study in bhubaneswar so accordingly i when i did the uh, designed the study i uh, collected information like this i did a purposive random sampling this particular hypothesis i wanted to test so i took 15 workers from 10 different type of work i you know, studied those workers in bhubaneswar and in sambalpur two cities and the way i collected my data was it was through recall but through you know their time allocation labor allocation so i asked them this question what activities you did during 7 am to 9 am yesterday versus what activities you did during same time on the heat wave day the day we did the survey it was a normal summer but 15 days before they had a very severe heat wave day so i just tried to ask them you know during that day versus yesterday so as you can see here there is a lot of uh, you know a bias there is recall bias uh, and also there is reporting bias there can be any number of bias people may have forgotten and all that but in spite of that we got some good evidence that okay heat wave is affecting so by asking this type of question so i divided the time from 7 a.m to 11 p.m into two hour duration and during these two hours we noted down their activities what they did yesterday during those two hours, 7 to 9, 9 to 11, 11 to 1, likewise, and what they did, what activities they did during the heat wave day, right? So then I put those activities in three categories, rest, family work, and work. So rest means, you know, whether they're sleeping, they woke up late, or they're taking rest, uh, you know, uh, near their workplace, below a tree, or if there is a family work, dropping the child to the school, buying vegetables, or doing, you know, uh, help in the cooking, any of those things, housework, and also work in commanding activities. And then, uh, <clears throat> sorry. So these are the people, you know, we studied, as you can see here, here is a uh, cobbler, uh, there is a, you know, uh, gold, that's a smith, iron smith, and these uh, auto drivers. And I think here he, there is a guy who was the trolley driver selling things in his trolley, likewise. So we asked these people, and very painstakingly, and this is the group uh, who did their survey in Sambalpur, and I don't have pictures from Bhubaneswar, who is uh, Dr. Mania did the survey in Bhubaneswar. And these are the activities, you know, vegetable seller, cobbler, construction worker, pulley, etc. These are the uh, 10 different activities we covered. And mostly you can see here that 84% or uh, mostly 94% of the male uh, household health were earning member, but we did have some female as the uh, you know, workers here. Hindus, general caste rate 18%, most, mostly SCs and OBCs were the rest of them. So very poor people with very low education. Now coming to some of the result. So when you did this, you know, uh, put those activities into three categories and measured the time allocation, you can see here almost every category said that, you know, they needed more rest during the uh, heat wave day. And the maximum was by these people who are doing manual work like Kuli, Riksa, trolley driver, construction workers. So they are the ones who needed more time to take rest. And where did they come at that time? So not much could be extracted from the housework because that has this constraint. So ultimately, their outside work also suffered. So I tried to took the average. So it said that on average, they took 1.65 hours more rest on the heat wave day compared to a normal summer day, out of which only this much could be extracted from the housework. So the work time suffered were reduced by 1.19 hours. 
So taking the hourly wage rate, we try to see you know, how much is the loss in income because of the uh, less labor allocation to work because they needed more rest. Okay, and then uh, I tried also to say how they're adapting, what type of expenditure there. So on different items, we try to measure the expenditure. So if there is a difference in ex monthly expenditure in a heat wave month compared to a normal summer month, so they gave some estimates. Putting, you know, those using those estimates, it came out that around, you know, on a heat wave month, they're spending around 600 rupees more compared to the normal uh, expenditure in other months. And this extra expenditure is mainly because of using uh, higher electricity, using a lot of ice, ice cream, buying curd, cucumber, and you know, lot many things, consumable items, you know, sending children in you know, autos, likewise, many things they kept the example. So this is how they're spending more money uh, monthly also whenever there are heat wave days. And this is the monthly uh, extra expenditure. This is the annual expenditure. So from annual expenditure, I measured the monthly expenditures. It came out that around 8% of the monthly expenditure is the extra burden on the households because of the heat waves in a summer month, okay? And as on average, there are six to seven heat waves in a month during May and June. So I said on this, by dividing by 600 rupees per month, which is around 1.4% of their monthly income on the consumer non-durables. Then also I try to see their expenditure on consumer durables, what exactly they're doing to bear this heat wave. So they say we do these are the things, white floor repeatedly using cooling ingredients, put thick layer of paddy straw on rooftop, to stop transmission of a heat likewise here they have done use a thick cotton insulate wall with paint mud purchase fan purchase air water cooler purchase freeze purchase air conditioner so as you can see here the maximum thing people are doing and maximum households are doing or buying fans or putting thick layer of paddy straw on the roof to stop transmission of heat. Baki, the rest of the things were done by very few, one or two households. So that this was two of the main you know, adaptive activity uh, that people were following in those region, in those slums of Bhubaneswar and in Sambalpur to cope with the heat stress. This is a 2013-14 information. Then I try to analyze because you know these things once they do that can you know stay for uh, like uh, wipe the floor that is a one time activity every day they have to do whereas if they put thick layer they say this can stay for one year the next year after rains they all get you know damaged so we have to replace it that lifetime is one year if they use cottons that can stay with them for four five years if they insulate the wall that again can be two years so likewise i had taken data on from them on the lifetime of these different adaptation activities and using the lifetime i try to annualize the expenditure so using that so we could you know find out the annual average cost of the activity that was an equation that was given in the paper so it came out that Weighted up annual average for a sample household came out to be 592 rupees. So if you divide this, this is annual expenditure on this type of activities. So if you divide this by 12, which is the number of heat waves in a year, so that this is how it came out with the expenditure. And then uh, extra expenditure of the poor slum households, a non durable is 100, durable is 49 and work time loss is 46 that comes around 195 rupees i think this particular study was the first one that came out with an estimation of the private cost of adaptation of the informal sector because of heat waves so i think that was the beauty of the study in spite of all those limitations it could get published so quickly and professor robert mandelson took personal interest in seeing that this paper is out so this is what it was one then after this study was published i have been wanting to do a very you know uh, a careful study with a lot of information uh, so that we come out with a very robust estimate of the economic loss of the slum dwellers because of uh, heat waves so i did this so efd financed this study and then i wanted to uh, this daily study was a design Initially, this study was designed for Bhubaneswar, and we had almost done almost every background preparation was made. But suddenly, 
uh, the cyclone Pani came in May, and we had to give up. And then, then we quickly did the study in Delhi. And uh, so what we did here, we study households in two slums during peak heat for a month. The same household was studied repeatedly for one month. And uh, we study households who work in the same area so that there is no impact of the outside, other areas on the uh, work or income. So we try to dilute, we try to neutralize the, you know, environment, the effect of environmental factors on the slum holders' income during summer. And household selection was that we took the principal earner who are not salaried, work in the same occupation in the informal sector, and are self-employed or on a daily or a piece rate wage. So that means they're all dependent on the environment, on the um, weather. We used household fixed effect. So, and, and only two other controls we have in the uh, estimation that was the weak dummy and the eighth dummy. Other than that, we did not have any other X variable other than the temperature measures. And we used different measures for temperature and humidity. And uh, we, then we try to see the impact on daily income, expenditure, health status, sleep, rest time and work time. So these are the welfare indicators and you try to see with the increase in temperature how these indicators are getting affected, you know, in this slum dwellers. Now, so these are the occupations you can see here, very similar to the type of people who studied in Bhubaneswar and I studied in Bhubaneswar and the Sambal pool and, you know, uh, this washerman, construction workers, painter, pulley, cycle rickshaw driver, e rickshaw driver, etc., etc. And so this data generation was very, very carefully handled, though there were a lot of trouble also with the agency. But, you know, we try to be as careful as possible. The study was done in Jakhira and Kirtinagar. These are the two slums very close to each other in Northwest Delhi. So we used a computer application and we used to cover to software. This was the software we used to collect the data. We hired some 20 uh, enumerators and each enumerator was given 20 households to survey daily and for one month. So principal owner was interviewed daily at the workplace about yesterday's income, expenditure, health status, rest, time of living and returning home. These were the only information so that every time the enumerator goes to the person to collect information, he or she doesn't have to spend more than five to six minutes. Because if you have a long questionnaire, then obviously they are refusing to reply you repeatedly. So because it was a repeated survey, so we wanted to make the questionnaire very simple and only collected information on the variable of interest. Okay. And then we also had a cross check photograph at the end of the survey and lat long of the place where they go, we tried to match it. And we had arrays to keep an eye. So 10 numbers, then also in between, because of the checks, we have hired some enumerators and we also dropped some households. So ultimately, initially, I started with a 30 enumerators and you will ultimately landed with 20 enumerators. And in, though we wanted to do some 600 households, but ultimately, we were left with 400 households. So we had to drop a lot of observations because there was a lot of outliers, duplicate entries, etc. So in total, we got 12,160 data points. And after dropping those, and after careful checking, we returned only 9,972 data points. So this is how, though there was issue in this data, but we tried to be careful, as careful as possible. So we missed some data, but then whatever data we had, that way more or less accurate. So we could, you know, see uh, from different point of view, we could see that, okay, these data points, 9,972 are more or less not having lot many issues. So this is how the you can see that these are the households who were surveyed. We have a lot of, this is Jakira area, this is Kirtinagar area, because most of the numerators from Kirtinagar were fired. So we had a lot of information from Jakira and uh, less information from Kirtinagar. And this was the identification. So can, I'm just going to stop after two, a few more slides. This was the identification, a very, very simple equation where Y is our welfare indicators. And uh, this is, these are the temp, different, you know, uh, uh, temperature, the, the fixed effects. And this is uh, the, the different measures of our temperature. 
So we used maximum temperature, minimum temperature, average temperature, humidity, and also the wet uh, bulb temperature, which this is the formula that we used for that. So this wet bulb temperature is a very globally recognized, you know, unbiased measure of the heat stress because in uh, temperature may not be very accurate because you know, uh, 36, 35 degree temperature in North, uh, in Europe may be very fatal, but not in a tropical country. Whereas in tropical countries, 45 to 47 degree temperature can be that fatal. So using temperature at estimates are always, you know, uh, giving you results which cannot be comparable uh, across the globe. So people try to use this wet bulk temperatures. That's what also we did. And then the other thing we did was we used the inverse hyperbolic sign transformation of Y. Because some of in some of the cases, especially when you have a Y which is having some negative values, then you cannot use the log transformation. So that is a situation where inverse hyperbolic sign transformation is advised. And that's what we did for all our income or expenditure measures. Right. So uh, then now coming to this data. So this this is how we had the total earning of the different days. So you can see that a lot of variation. And this is the total expenditure. And this is the total uh, medical expenditure. So on some days, most of the household had zero. And so that is very, these are the amount and these are the density percentage of households. And coming, this is the summary statistics. Maybe you can, I just wanted to tell you that on the maximum temperature varied from 34 to 48 degree, minimum temperature varied from 21 to 33. So this minimum temperature came out to be something which was more fatal than the maximum temperature in case of Delhi. And then, you know, uh, so these are the other data that says how many hours they slept, whether they sick, or how much money they spent in the medical expenditure, et cetera, et cetera. Now, coming to some of these results, now you can see here. So these are the, so you see the variation in maximum temperature. And the variation, this red one is the minimum temperature and the green one is the wet bulb temperature. So you can see there is a lot of variation over there. And uh, the wet bulb temperature is more closer because when you say heat stress, Heat stress is basically dependent more on the minimum temperature because when the minimum temperature goes up, then the comfort level also goes down. So this wet bulb temperature, as it is designed, tries to measure the comfort level of the human beings because of the change in the high minimum and maximum temperature. So it's more closer to this one. So that's what is seen here. And then in the next one, we try to see this wet bulb temperature and negative of log earning. So this is the inverse of the income. As you can see here, that is a very good matching. So as the uh, temperature, the wet bulb temperature is going down, the income is increasing. So the inverse is going down. So as this is going up, the income is going down. So the inverse is also going up. So you can see here that the plotting itself tells us that, okay, the wet bulb you know, temperature is strongly affecting the income of the households. And then, uh, so this, uh, this is how we did the regressions. You can see here, very limited dependent, uh, you know, independent variable. We did, this is the dependent variable gross earning uh, regressions. So this is inverse hyperbolic transformation of total earning. So this is all total earning. Now here in this model, we have maximum, minimum, and relative humidity. And in this equation, we have relative humidity and the mean temperature. And in this equation, we have only all this in the controls and plus the weight bulb temperature. Because this WBT is taking into account the maximum, minimum, and also the relative humidity. So here, when you are using this one, you are not using any other measures of the temperature. So you can see here, almost everywhere, you have a negative effect and highly significant. And we did this regression uh, for all our indicators, you know, um, depending on, you know, whether it is income or expenditure or net expenditure or medical expenditure or et cetera, and all raw material expenditure or expenditure on other type of, you know, um, uh, commodities. And then uh, some of, I'm not showing you all the regression results. So you can see here, so these are the plotting of the coefficients. So this makes the things, you know, much more better. So you can see here, 
so these three are for minimum temperature this is uh, sorry minimum temperature this is for mean temperature or average temperature and this is for the wet bulb global temperature because in many cases you know the maximum temperature did not come out to be significant in delhi so it came out that in delhi because it's only you know traditionally this has been a very you know hot area so if the maximum temperature is going up people are not suffering so much but if the minimum temperature is going up so that they are not able to sleep so then that is affecting all their uh, income as well as expenditure and also health status so you can see total earning is going down so from 7% or maybe this is around uh, little layer 6% to 13% the net earning is also going down so something like 8%, 10% and for uh, wet bulb temperature something around 19% which is so so strong but expenditure though uh, only for a minimum temperature there is increase but there is no robustness because this is the confidence interval is touching the zero line. So you can see here that we have a robust finding that increase in temperature uh, is decreasing their total earning and also their net earning, which is net of the expenditure on the raw materials. Then next we uh, plotted this one, marginal effect of heat measures on medical expenditure. As you can see here, medical expenditure is going up, all are above zero. And that is varying from say 7% to minimum expansion to 10 percent until here this around 13 to 14 percent that's significant increase in the medical expenditure and then this is what we did whether uh, the probability of sick the red one are probability of sick almost everywhere you see that probability went up about one percent to five percent to six percent so people reported that that is the 6% higher probability of people falling ill because of uh, increase in temperature, irrespective of the temperature measures. Whether they visited a doctor, not robust, it, everywhere it is touching the zero line, so not very robust, though, uh, you know, we got a positive answer, yes, but they're not very strong. Then, uh, did you sleep well? Again, a very, you know, statistically significant uh, result that no, and here the coefficients are negative and nowhere that touching the zero line, the confidence interval is very, very uh, narrow. So you can see here, people said that no, they were not able to sleep well. And did you go to work? Again, we do not have a very significant uh, answer here, though in some cases they said no, but here again, when you are using the mean temperature, it was insignificant. So that means there is no robust finding that they did sacrifice their uh, work time right so so this is again another one that is on the hours slept hours worked and hours rested the same philosophy the same you know uh, line of argument that i used in my bhubaneswar uh, and sambalpur study so we try to find out so hours slept has gone down everywhere because there has been the minimum temperature has been the main culprit over here but when it comes to hours worked again we do not have this you know blue ones again we do not have a very significant uh, observation and so also on hours rested during the day so it went down in this case but in other cases we do not have a very uh, significant uh, result so this is how we also got the result that says just to conclude that income is going down medical expenditure is going up and other expenditures are going up. So because of which the net income is going down, the probability of a sleeping is going down, and also the probability of a suffering or a health impact are also going down. So this is how we had some very robust uh, you know, result from the Dili study that says that heat stress or every degree increase in the minimum temperature or mean temperature or wet bulb temperature is having a strong negative impact on people's well-being, at least measured in terms of total income, net income, or probability of illness, or probability of suffering or spending money on medicines.
right? So this is how then I conclude here. The study um, brings out some undiluted impact of summer heat stress and well-being of poor informal sector urban workers living in slum. Higher temperature temperature in tropical city are associated with less sleep, more self-reported sickness, medical expenditure, and lower earning. The effect on earning is very large, a 19% drop in the net earning per one degree increase in the wet world temperature and 8% drop per one degree increase in the daily mean temperature. These results have strong policy indicators such 85% more uh, than you know more than 85 percent labor force in developing countries who work in the informal sector and maximum of them live in slum or temporary settlements so far government intervention has been limited to coerce people to minimize exposure to minimize health impacts i think you know uh, even in orissa all our heat or management has been focusing on reducing the health impact you know give them you know awareness provide water and that should be uh, on disturbed supply of electricity but nobody is really talking about the income loss or the extra expenditure on health or extra expenditure on some food items to cope up so i think this is where we really i policy makers we really need to you know uh, make the policy makers aware that you know health the temperature impact and heat stress impact is not only health it is also a lot more economics and uh, they need different type of interventions so that you know, at least the, uh, the economic burden of the heat waves on the poor slum dwellers can be minimized. So this is what I conclude my study and I also wanted to thank EFD and also uh, TTI grant at IEG and also uh, Professor Manus Panda, who has been the director of IGG when I did both these studies, and he's been really helpful uh, to execute this study in both the places. And these are the ones who provided very good you know, research support. And also thanks to my co-author, uh, Professor So Manathan, who was the co-author in the daily study. Right. So I stop sharing over here. And I now request you for your feedback um uh, thank you so very much <clears throat> professor uh, das uh, i think uh, the, the, the 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 real richness uh, and the uniqueness of your study uh, remains that maybe this is one of the first studies as you said and whatever little you know about this uh, subject uh, is sort of focusing on a largely uh, a, a kind of a largely neglected uh, working population who are in the urban uh, informal sector. In fact, uh, it, this is an important uh, study, uh, even in terms of studies broadly, uh, in, in terms of the contribution of the informal sector to the economy. Uh, and like the losses that you are referring to uh, because of heat stress, uh, and your sort of emphasis on two things, whatever I understood, uh, is that the minimum uh, temperature is actually the culprit, which means that there is not just a question of uh, health uh, uh, issues. In fact, it's, it's more of a question of actual uh, loss in uh, income. Uh, and also, uh, in terms of uh, the state uh, having not quite uh, thought through uh, how to help uh, these people in the adaptation of this uh, heat stress. So, uh, I think, uh, uh, but before I shall open uh, the floor for any questions, uh, comments, etc. Uh, so I just wanted to ask one small thing, like, uh, is there any single way by which you have defined uh, the heat wave? Uh, like, like in some places, I uh, read that it is 35 degrees with uh, high humidity and sort of like 40 degrees with less humidity uh, is how it is defined. But is there any special way by which we have a regionally differentiated heat we have uh, parameters or something like yeah yeah so let me answer you uh, first of all thank you very much for your uh, appreciating words uh, when i did the study in bhubaneswar so we had the definition of heat waves uh, by imd bhubaneswar so i used their definition so when i said you know because this was only two point of time so the heat wave day that was referred to was the day when the temperature has gone more than 45 degrees Okay, and then it is a normal summer. In normal summer means if the temperature is between 30, less than 37 in Bhubaneswar and less than, I think, 39 in Sambalpur, then this is normal summer. 
and uh, so i use their definition and in the delhi study this is basically temperature variation because this study the data was collected throughout the month okay and the temperature was varying from uh, 38 degree to 48 or 49 degree so we had a lot of days you know where the temperature has really crossed 45 that is when you have a heat wave in delhi because delhi is uh, basically an you know uh, hot area northern india so we uh, in delhi study it is basically per degree uh, deviation from in temperature the marginal effect yeah that's what i did um so now uh, it's open to uh, the audience like uh, any question kindly be brief uh, and you can ask a question or make a comment or whatever but please be brief thank you please uh, do unmute and ask your question Uh, ma'am, good evening. Ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Thank you, Sushant. Please. Ma'am, actually, uh, what my question is that regarding uh, you, you have studied regarding the economic impact, but, but my question is a little bit uh, beyond that. My question is who is mostly uh, impacted by that that the heat waves uh, that uh, 20 to 30, 30 to 40 or 40 to 50 years age persons or 50 to more? This is my question, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. So I know like in that uh, we do have data on the age of the household head. So I think this is a good question. Maybe I really need to see, though this is one angle we didn't see because we wanted to see the loss for the household. But then, you know, I think this is a very interesting angle. You can see, you know, whether uh, uh, the household which is, who is being headed by an aged person who is having more experience and maybe they have a more knowledge in how to cope with these things. Maybe they are suffering less than a household who is having headed by a younger person having less experience in terms of, you know, adapting to heat waves. I think this is one angle I did not see, but I think it will be really interesting to see that whether the household heads experience in suffering heat waves and adapting to it is making a difference. Yeah, I think I'll try to see that. Thank you very much. But I did not uh, examine this question in my study. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Amrita. Uh, yeah. Amrita, I think Binagra Sarah also raised hand probably. OK. Yes, uh, Shodamini ma'am, thank you very much. Uh, no, I heard you now after a long time. Uh, it's really a very interesting study. Am I audible? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I was just wondering, uh, maybe I missed from your presentation. Uh, you talked about the zero expenditures uh, on health and also uh, the loss of income. Uh, uh, sometimes it, it, it goes to zero. So, did you economically uh, handle these uh, unexplained zeros that, that zeros may not be true zeros? Maybe because of some other reasons it was reported as zero in the data. So, um, uh, did you address it economically? I was just wondering this. Maybe you have spoken about it, but I could have missed it. I, I, I don't, I'm not very sure. Yeah, but no, it's a very I wonderful study. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Amrita. It's really a pleasure to listen to you after so many years. So um, I didn't discuss this particular question here in the talk. So we had a lot of zeros. Uh, you know, people didn't say, spend money on health, or you know, they didn't earn anything. So we try to use some of those um, zero inflated models here. And uh, so I think we did also, I think some censoring was imposed uh, by our estimation, but we didn't get much robust, you know, much, no stronger result for this. Okay. We also try to do this, mm. but mm. Uh, most of these results, we do, we try to, you know, uh, emphasize more on the heat measures. Mm -hmm. Rather than this, because you know, we also cross check if somebody is not spending money on health, so they also do not have any family member suffering. Because we had mm -hmm. these questions if anybody in your family or yourself have any health impact, did you visit a doctor? And then we try to match it if you visited a doctor, whether they have a health expenditure or not. So, most of the zeros are the ones where they did not visit a doctor or you know. Nobody was ill in the family. So the zeros are really not you know, generated through some different data generating process. 
uh sometimes uh, uh, sorry i'm interrupting you sometimes what happens that the uh, not seek, uh, seeking any uh, health service or not visiting doctor itself dip is dependent on many other factors so you know, the health seeking behavior depends on many other factors maybe That's some true. households people are uh, suffering from some illness but they are not aware enough or for some other reasons they are not going to doctor so that was the reason that that something uh, you know embedded in those zeros and those zeros are not true zeros so yeah, uh, yeah. that's Very why good. i asked yeah. Yeah. exactly so you know ludo um, we did try to i think only because you were using the ols in most of these cases so we use sensing zero sensing models uh, but in some cases i think maybe we can re examine this questions a bit more carefully yeah. and uh, but zero sensing did not give us any you know uh, result that did not deviate our result of the heat stress and income loss yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, professor uh, professor vinayak rath please professor rath wanted to ask something professor vinayak rath uh i'm not sure if he's here so any uh, anyone else please be brief um um uh, yes mr uh, mrutunjay sir bolli mrutunjay sir please Ye yes professor mrutunjay mr you have to unmute yes mrutunjay sir you have to unmute to speak yeah, sorry done. thank you thank you kesu bhai ha uh, ha namaste madam sodam and madam namaste uh, actually really, it's really a very very interesting work because i have worked on air pollution and health so i enjoyed of course for 10 15 minutes i missed your uh, talk because of some personal difficulties madam have you taken that uh, self reporting health status or you took the medical uh, i mean admissions uh, into the hospitals i'm sorry if you have explained i i beg apology for that uh, because uh, when we take that uh, self reporting system many times people go for self medication and they do not uh, reveal that so I, i i think this is a limitation of the work also you might have faced this difficulty and uh, another important thing madam when we talk of cost of illness and we take this uh, human capital approach labor lost and that very recently we have done a work on valuing the statistical life in the mining area one of my one of my paper published in the, uh, the arabian journal of uh, geoscience we find that uh, many times there are some uh, incidental expenses or corollary health expenditure uh, that also is missing in some cases uh, since i am interested in some other some kind of this kind of work in future i for the sake of knowledge i seek uh, some of the information from you so that i can incorporate it uh, yeah. uh further again i beg, beg apology because i missed your talk for some time no, no. thank you no in the beginning you know uh, these issues were never discussed so thank you very much again for these uh, questions so you see this is a survey data so we took in a self reported data only because when you are doing a survey of the households obviously you cannot check it from the hospitals because uh, only when you are working on the secondary data then hospital records are very useful and when you want to have the household level information because these questions from the second because we wanted to see how they are adapting so these are all the primary information we wanted to collect so that is why it's all self reported but yeah, then yeah. you know we do, yeah. the way we ask them this question we try to minimize the self reported bias in my you original know, study yeah. there was bias because you know we yeah. were asking them about the previous days but Thank there is no other Thank way of doing that so this is one but in the delhi study we try to minimize the bias very minimum and then repeatedly we are going to asking the same household same question very okay. few and having a okay. lot of other uh, cross checks so this is one and second one yeah. is so, you know there are so many obviously Uh, we try to ask them the medical expenditure on items on where they are spending the money medicine doctor fees 
don't know any other you know uh, medical equipment they purchased if any family members was hospitalized so these are the items we try to collect information so maybe uh, something we have missed out it's uh, difficult and also some of these medical you know expenditure that was reported by the households uh, also a lot of outliers were also there so maybe households, you know, they uh, over reported or maybe the family was having some history of the illness and they attributed that this illness is because of the heat. So we try to cross check these things. So only the, the marginal change in expenditure and also we try to revalidate by going to the household. And you know, as you said, you know, with all the uh, outlayers we try to delete all the outlayers by just blindly deleting all the top 0.5 uh, percent of the observations because the very high uh. values and those values could not be explained so given the data generation process and the way we collected it so we try to be as careful as possible but definitely there could be bias and there could be few things you know which you are not able to capture in this study uh. yeah uh, you know, I really welcome if any of you work on this and also come out with you know other observations because the more study we have, the stronger and you know statement we'll be able to make to the policymaker. Yeah, just uh, one one uh, uh, one cut to cut uh, information I need, madam. You in the beginning told that uh, there is some kind of dose response relationship uh, between. And uh, this, uh, this um, temperature and uh, the incidence of disease. Is it there in Professor Somnathan's study? Uh, Somnathan study, he was, uh, yeah, I think um, he, they also studied the garment sector and they are also finding out that every one degree increase, they are also using the marginal effect. So the marginal effect can very easily be linked to dose response. Yeah, so and yeah. he is finding that the every one degree increase in the wet bulb temperature is leading to two percent decrease in the output of the garment sector. So this is one. Yeah. 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 I think. Thank uh, you. Uh, Thank uh, you so much. Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, Professor Binay Rotha, please. Sir, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening to everybody. I must congratulate Professor Das for nice presentation. I have still some concerns. The studies that we have done long back around Delhi, that is in the early, like uh, 90, the late 90s, we have found there's a lot of variation in the workforce between male and female. Yeah. The gender variation is not reflected in the study. Yeah. Fortunately, God has given more tolerance power to the ladies. The ladies can bear most of the hit even and the other problems. Even if they're sick, they don't go to the doctor's cell. In Delhi, I have found if a male child is falling sick, they will be taken to the doctor. If a female child is falling, is falling sick, they say automatically it will cure. Nobody bothers. This is an interesting point. So have you studied that what is the impact of this uh, heat wave on women and men, I think the impact will be totally different when you study the behavior of men and when you study the behavior of women. Yeah. And most of the inf informal sector, particularly in Bhubaneswar, more women work in the informal sector. Yeah. In, and, and also some assaults in Delhi. So women constitute a major force in the informal sector. And once we investigate, exactly what is happening to their income earning capacity and yeah. also their health impact. Yeah. Yeah. This is one dimension which can be investigated. Thank you very much. I think it's an interesting study that I enjoyed the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, congratulations to Professor Das. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Rat. You know, like we had information in Borisa, we had only 5% of the sample that, you no, know, only 6% were uh, female headed households. So that was a very small sample, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, generalize any uh, answer on the gender uh, line. In Delhi, we tried to do that. Most of our households were female headed. But, you know, there was one issue that 
on the day one, we had one survey that collected all the demography and other household level features. And day two onwards, it was the regular, you know, heat and income study. So after the study, because we missed some of these enumerators, so the household IDs were, you know, so much mismatched that the day one data and the day two onwards data were not able to match. So that was one reason which, for which we could not go on the gender line. But definitely, I agree, you know, like most of my studies, whenever I have had a gender, you know, uh, uh, in, you know, angle, so women, they do better. They're more resilient, they do better, and their coping is very different than the coping of the head household. So, so also income loss will be different. But unfortunately, in this study, this we are not able to examine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Jyoti Satpati, please. Yes, uh, sir. Namaskar. Good evening. <clears throat> it's a very, very, very pertinent uh, paper as far as uh, global climate and regional climate change is concerned. Now there is a new field which has come up, uh, climatonomics. It is climate studies plus economics. It's a new, new field. Fine. So this paper fits into that uh, field arena. Uh, Professor Sodamini, ma'am, uh, when we are talking of stress, there are three allied siblings. One is frustration, rejection, and dejection. And this leads to a state of mental fatigue, right? So when it is very strong heat outside or very cold waves going on outside, we generally tend to remain indoors. And our psychology doesn't match with that because after all, nature cannot be overcome. Uh, nature means the environmental nature. So in your paper, ma'am, uh, can, we, can we extrapolate your paper now, taking this as the base with elements of fatigue, migration, climatic changes in different climatic zones of India. Reason being, you have uh, clustered your studies around Sambalpur and Delhi. Fine. But uh, I think we can move on to the more warmer climates in Rajasthan, like Barmer, where the temperature touches 50 plus, and somewhere in the northeast, uh, you know, where the temperature touches uh, minus 2, minus 4, minus 6. And uh, we, can, we can now expand your paper in case you agree with some aspects of cognitive behavioralism and economic psychology perspectives. Uh, so, Thank you. In fact, yeah. I'll speak to your phone on this. Thank you so much. We can yeah, find yeah. your paper. It's a very Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sapathi. But I think this is a very interesting idea. But the data that I have for this paper, I don't think it can be really, you know, because we have very limited information, mostly on the income. and the stress side, we only have whether you are ill or not, yes, no. So only the yes no answer cannot be extrapolated to uh, you know uh, capture this different aspect of stress that we are talking about. Probably we'll be needing a different data set for that. And I think taking maybe an experimental study on your because this idea is very good because there's so much of work happening on the stress. And you know, like everybody is really wanting to know how exactly you know people are coping up because uh, different climatic environment is causing different level of stress. And so I think that can be easily captured if you do an experimental study. But because my are, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think we, we have less time now. I think one more person. So let's not have uh, one Jyoti, more question now. I think Jyoti Rekha has raised her hand. Yeah, can uh, please, Jyoti Rekha, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for your nice deliberation. May my question is uh, uh, if people are visiting hospitals for his stress. Uh, what is the major uh, response? I mean, what type of health impact was uh, majorly found among uh, the respondents? Yeah. Uh, so like, uh, uh, I, I did not present that in my governess study. Maximum, you know, they had uh, temperature. Few people, they said, you know, they are, uh, you know, getting unconscious. They have blood vision. So I think six, seven different health symptoms were very frequent in Bhubaneswar and in Sambalpur. Whereas in Delhi, uh, most of them, they said uh, they have a high temperature and body ache. Not many. We have this, you know, detailed information. I didn't share it here, but we did capture what exactly, what type of health symptoms they have. We are giving them 10 options. And these 10 options were taken from uh, Odisha, you know, our uh, uh, health department. Uh, Odisha health department family, welfare, and health. This department has already identified what type of you know health uh, impact can be attributed to heat stress. So we gave them yes. those options. So the maximum heart ticked either uh, body ache or uh, temperature increase or dizziness. 
But one thing that I wanted to tell in Bhubaneswar and Sambalpur, because Orissa is very close to sea, probably the daytime temperature was causing a lot of impact. Whereas in Delhi, people didn't mind daytime temperature. It's the nighttime temperature that was causing maximum impact on their health as well as on the income. Ma'am, uh, did you find any um, response related to cardiovascular disease? Uh, uh, cardiovascular, I think it was there in uh, Sambalpur. Some people said, you know, they went to hospitalized and, you know, somebody had a stroke. Uh, but in Delhi, no. Nobody ticked that, though I think we did not uh, tick that, but we had any other. So in any other one or two households in Sambalpur had ticked cardiovascular, but in uh, Delhi, uh, nobody reported about that. But mostly it was either a headache or a body ache or a temperature. Yeah, yeah that was. Uh, uh, any other question or comment very briefly, because we have almost come to the close of the time that you set. Uh, looks like uh, there are no more questions or comments. Um, so thank you again, uh, Professor Sudhamini Das. It has been a great pleasure uh, to have you uh, for our this special uh, event. Uh, and uh, also uh, your very, very interesting ways to respond to several uh, questions that people asked. Mm, uh, I think uh, this is a subject in which Many of us will be interested uh, in future. We, we will not match up to you uh, in terms of uh, the skills that you have. But I think this area of like climate change and the informal sector, I think, would really uh, uh, sort of provoke us to do uh, more uh, work on this. And maybe at some point, we will also look forward to make some comparison between like workers in the, uh, in the, at the lower rungs in the formal sector how they compare with workers uh, in the informal sector. Yes. Uh, so it's not that all uh, everybody in formal sector is better off. Uh, so maybe in the same place, um, like those with very low income, if we take that as kind of a, a base, uh, so whether there has been any particular uh, changes. Uh, uh, and of course, as Professor Binagrat asked, this, this very important question about gender uh, differences, I think that will also be very interesting. So uh, with that, uh, we are very, very happy uh, and uh, it, it was absolutely learning experience for all of us. Uh, so thank you uh, so very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank uh, you so much. And uh, I really enjoyed, you know, I never knew that I'll get this response from uh, all participants. Thank you for all the questions. And thank you, uh, Professor Das, for this kind introduction and this invitation. I think I really felt very honored to <laughs> give this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amarendra, and thank you all participants for all your interesting questions. And this has also given me a lot of ideas how to extend my study in different lines, particularly the gender uh, line is gender and also the zeros. I think these are the ones I think I really from this data set itself, I can extend to those lines. So thank you very much. And it was a pleasure, great pleasure. And I hope I did, you know, I didn't uh, meet up to the expectation of uh, you know delivering lecture in memory of Aditya Sar. No, 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 certainly yes. Uh, so, Amarandra, uh, any last words? No, I would, I would like to only thank uh, uh, Professor Sodhamir Das for the very brilliant presentation. Uh, I think uh, all of us, including me uh, and participants, must have learned actually, you know, how rigorous actually we should you know, attempt actually, for a paper. And starting from the modeling part to doing uh, like uh, econometric analysis and uh, taking care of each concerns. So it was thoroughly, you know, a brilliant paper. So thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, presenting this brilliant paper in in memory of our dear sir. And uh, thank you, Keshav sir, presiding over, for presenting over this meeting. And thank you all participants for putting up your questions. So thank you so much. We can thank you, thank you, Amarendra. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. All right. So I think with this, we close.